Hello everybody out there, Chris and Mike here, and welcome back to another Dark Avenger comic book review. Guys, this is a huge pile, this is a week late, we are dressed in the holiday stuff because technically, even though these books were released on December 17, 2014, this review was supposed to take place before Christmas, so we were going to deck the hall, so to speak, in our Christmas attire for this review and the next two reviews. So, while the shirts might change, the hats will remain for at least two more reviews because it's the holiday season. And then we go into uh, the new year, which there's a lot of things I'm looking forward to in comics, games, everything. There's a lot to look forward to in 2015. 2014 really breezed by this year. And um, it's been amazing. But anyway, these books were released uh, a couple of weeks ago now. So we're already, today's Friday when we're recording this, and actually it just turned into Saturday, but beside the point, uh, tomorrow the book should be coming, if the mail is nice. So these books are already super late, so we are going to breeze through these books. I'm going to try to do this in under 28 minutes, it probably will go a little bit longer because there's a lot of books. Uh, but we're going to go right, get right down to it instead of going as in-depth as we normally do. Hopefully by the end of the month, when we only have four books to review, things will go a lot faster, and we'll catch up. But for right now, we're playing the catch-up game. This week, we're starting with Marvel, all-new X-Men, issue number 34. The old, I feel like it's been a while since I read this book, number one. Number two, the all-new X-Men is still trapped all throughout the Ultimate Universe. I feel like, you know, Iceman is dealing with his problem. Beast is still stuck with Doctor Doom. X-23 is dealing with James Jr., and then we have Gene, who has now met Ultimate Eugene, and when they aren't fighting, uh, they decide to read each other's minds to, you know, figure out what's going on, and I thought it was hilarious because after reading their minds, which I like that page, they kind of both faint. And that's really all we see of Gene until towards the end of the book where... Apparently, everything's cool now. You know, they don't explain how Jean woke up or anything. She's just at Cerebro, and she's trying to find the mutant that teleported them there so she can fix everything, and it turns out she finds something else through Cerebro, and it, it ends there. She's like, is that real? Question mark. And Miles kind of has a crush on the uh, all-new X-Men uh, Jean Grey. Which is interesting because he's dating uh, Kate Bishop in the Ultimate Universe. But that's really the brief version of this book. Really not too much progressed other than Gene kind of making friends with the other Gene. And yeah, that's about really it. And the other X-Men stories are kind of progressing. And they claim one of the X-Men might stay in the Ultimate Universe. I hope that's not true because what we're having from the Ultimate Universe in the coming year is Ultimate Comics Spider-Man. So I hope that's not the case. Guardians of the Galaxy 22, Groot is now possessed with the Venom Oh, symbiote. yeah, I remember that, yeah. How's that going, friend? So, um, after the, the Guardians fight off Venom Groot, the symbiote escapes and then takes a hold of a Rocket. And the symbiote wants to basically gain control of one of the Guardians so that he could take the ship back to a certain Ooh. planet. So you got Venom... Rocket. So it's kind of like, I, it's the story we kind of figured was going to happen. The symbiote is basically bouncing around from one of the Guardians of the Galaxy to the other. Uh, Captain Marvel is on Spartax, and they basically want Peter Quell as their new uh, king. Or president, so to speak. And she thinks it's hilarious. At least it looks like she thinks it's hilarious. Uh... The ending, of course, spoiler alert here, Drax tries to physically remove the symbiote from Rocket, and then he gets possessed with the Venom symbiote. So, I guess all of them are going to get and one more. And all throughout this whole thing, Flash is dead asleep. I just think it's hilarious that Flash is just dead asleep, has no clue what's going on. But it's kind of funny. Uh, I'm enjoying this uh, story arc. I like that it's disconnected from any of the events going on and it's actually focusing just on the Guardians for once. Which won't matter soon because there's going to be a major crossover with, ironically, the all-new X-Men Guardians of the Galaxy and Star-Lord. Um, 
I believe it's going to be in a month or two. The Black Vortex or the Black something. Anyway, Fantastic Four, issue number 14. We find out that there was somebody behind the scenes of the Fantastic Four since basically the day they became the Fantastic Four. And you get the plot to this guy. And he's called the... Oh, God. It was so dumb when I heard the name. Nobody or something like that. Hold on. Somebody. Nobody. The Quiet Man. I'm sorry. And he's been multiple people all throughout the um, Fantastic Four's career since they began. He had this humongous crush on uh, Sue. And right when he was going to make his move, this is back in the day, that's when Reed came along and basically, in his eyes, the Quiet Man's eyes, stole Sue from him. And it's because of that this guy, the Quiet Man, has been making these plans and pushing all of these supervillains uh, towards the Fantastic Four to destroy them, all because he couldn't get the woman he loved. And uh, Reed's like, you've done all this, plus that, you jailed Ben, uh, Johnny lost his powers, we lost the kids and everything, you're screwing with Franklin's head to get those Avengers, you did all this, all because I got soon. He's like, yes, but I'm done being quiet. And then you could also see the wizard son, uh, what's his name, I forgot his name, Bentley. Uh, he's starting to sort of come around and you can see that. Uh, he's probably going to free the kids at some point. And then something goes on with uh, Ben and Sue at the end of the book and it basically has the Mighty Avengers written all over it and this has to do with Axis. Which from what I heard, since we are in the next week already, I heard it ended very stupidly and uh, oh, that's how wow. Tony Stark, and you, it, it explains how Tony Stark uh, narrowly escaped uh, being fixed. But let's stay in the Ultimate Universe, shall we? And go into Miles Morales, The Ultimate Spider-Man, issue number 8. If you are buying this book to read about Miles, you're going to get Jack Squad. Instead, you find out about Miles' father's past a bit. Apparently, Miles' father, we all know that Miles' uncle was... Uh, oh, God, I forgot the... Wow. Uh, taskmaster. And uh, the father was dragged into a situation when he was a kid by his brother, who later on in life becomes Taskmaster. And uh, basically Nick Fury, a young Nick Fury, and this is like way back when S.H.I.E.L.D. apparently was first coming into existence, he basically enlists um, Miles' father to go undercover and join this gang. Basically... Um, Miles' father gets dragged into something, and to get out, he basically beats the crap out of everybody. He basically has the same talents as Miles without the Spider-Man symbi- uh, the Spider-Bite or anything, the agility. He's able to beat the crap out of anyone. So Nick Fury takes him out of jail, gives him the situation. He joins the guy, and basically all this is to get to Wilson Fisk. Oh, the Kingpin. The Kingpin. And Miles' father is going to be the one that finds out what the Kingpin's plans are against the world and then stop him. Shit, but... He had a mustache? Or was that just the shade? And that's where the story kind of ends. And that's where Miles is like... In the father's like, do you, are you understanding everything that's going on? He's like, I think so. So the reason why the father ran away from Miles was because of his connections to his past. He's like, um, what did mom think of all this? And then he says, are you ready to stomach the rest of the story? Are you mad? He actually says, are you mad enough to hear the rest of the story? And he's like, yes, sir, I am. So I guess in the next issue we'll uh, continue with um, the father's past. But I, I like the cover for the next issue, I will say that. So I guess we'll wait and see what happens. But again, I have a feeling that this story arc is going to be all about Miles' dad's um, past with Nick Fury and S.H.I.E.L.D. and how intertwined Miles is, kind of like when uh, we found out that, uh, what's his name, uh, Norman Osborn uh, planned the whole thing with Peter Parker and Miles in a way. Very interesting. We're going into Spider-Verse now. Spider-Woman, issue number two, Spider-Woman goes undercover. And uh, in this universe that she's undercover in, there is an exact replica of her. Jessica Drew, and she's a complete and utter bitch, and you will hate her as you're reading this book. Not the real Spider-Woman, the fake one. And Silk is jumping from universe to universe to escape the uh, the Wonder Twin, the evil Wonder Twin, so to speak. 
And she finds out that there's one universe that they cannot traverse into, and that's because the universe is basically destroyed by um, nuclear war. And now that Silk knows that, that's going to definitely play into the main story, which, again, harkens to the fact that, yes, you don't have to buy every single book that's connected to Spider-Verse, but you kind of do because it gives you all the little tidbits that you wouldn't normally get in the main book. So anyway, Silk's device breaks before that, though, and she bumps into Jessica in uh, that universe, and, she get, and Jessica actually gives up her teleporter for Silk so Silk can continue running. And uh, we find out that uh, the Jessica Drew of that world, which she has locked away in a chest, which I thought that was hilarious, too, uh, it turns out she's Morloon's girlfriend, possibly? Huh. And if you want to know why Jessica is undercover, you'll have to read the book. I'm definitely enjoying uh, Spider-Woman. This is definitely a really good book. I can't wait for it to break away from Spider-Verse, though, because I'd really like to give Jessica Drew an honest shot without being connected to Spider-Man. I want to see how she's going to do it. And she's going to disconnect from Silk, too, because Silk is getting her own series as well as Spider-Gwen. So I'm looking forward to both of those series also. Jumping now into the Scarlet Spiders, issue number two. They find out about Gen X's cloning. They find out that there are a bunch of clones of all the inheritors. And basically when one dies, they basically download the memory of the uh, inheritor into the clone. And then continue. it's rinse and repeat every time an inheritor is killed. Also, the very beginning was really good with Johnny Storm where he gets beaten up by Ben and um, Kane. I love the artwork in this book. I love the artwork in every book that I've reviewed so far, but this artwork really speaks to me. I really do like it. And Kat, I hope you really did give this book another shot because it's really good. I don't know. I get that classic artwork feel when I read this book for some reason. I don't know why. But anyway, Morlun finds out that there's somebody in his building and, he, and obviously he's going to deal with it his own way. Um, I like this book. There was a lot of action to it. Uh, it turns out that Kane decides that they have to blow up the building. Obviously, this, again, is another tidbit that's very important to the main story because it's going to be up to the Scarlet Spiders to destroy this building, to destroy the clones of the Inheritors, so once they're dead, they're gone forever. So another important piece of the puzzle is in this miniseries. And um, they also, uh, Kane and Ben find out that, uh, what's his name, uh, Gen X was actually looking to clone his own spiders his own spider totems as well. And it's a really sick and twisted plot, which you guys have to read to find out, but it turns out the next issue, which is the grand finale, Gen X is actually going to be fighting against the Scarlet Spiders, and I can't wait to see uh, the last part of this story. I'm really intrigued by how this is going to end, and I hope that uh, Kane and Ben and uh, Jessica are able to destroy this building and destroy all the cloning machines and stop Gen X from being able to clone, to continue to clone all of his brothers and sisters. This way the Inheritors, once they're dead, they're gone forever. There's no more clones and there's no way for them to continue to regenerate, so to speak. We're going into Axis now. Mike, yes. you're first. Yeah, Hob you're finishing Marvel off. Yeah. This is Hob <clears throat> Excuse me. Hobgoblin. Three of three. So how did this end? Well... From what we saw in last issue... Oh, uh, oh, is it bad? It's kind of a little, uh... Is he still like a good something. guy by the end? Well, yeah, he's like still a good guy saying, you know, if you have any problems in New York, you know, you just get... Just call the Hobgoblin, and there's these little, uh, Hobgoblin buttons that he gives to his, uh, new people. They're called the Hob Heroes, actually. And then we, I, I know, then in Brooklyn days ago, we get into where, uh... Oh, they, they had to put Brooklyn in there. Yeah. Where uh, uh, one of them wanted to be a new Goblin Knight and stuff like that. And it was just a whole big thing where um, one of them was going to betray the uh, Hobgoblin. Which actually turned out over here. And the all works uh, really amazing, by the way. And uh, it was a hologram. And he just wanted to see if he could trust his teammates. So the Goblin King comes in. And it's basically Hobgoblin versus the King Goblin. A whole fight there, and there's a, a Superior Spider-Man issue number 26 uh, reference here, for that matter. 
And uh, let's just say that uh, one of them does win, and of course we know the obvious of that. And uh, there's going to be a bomb in one of them, and basically Hobgoblin kills his own team because, listen to this, he was going to uh, detonate them with the, the switch that had the button to explode, and Hobgoblin says, well, you know, that's what I do. I kill my own teammates, therefore eliminating the need for the detonator. And I was like, wow. So then after that, we have Steve Rogers who comes in and basically goes into access issue number six. So, uh... Oh, boy. I what? I mean... I can't wait for this series to be over because... I, I've I, heard I, nothing but horrible things about access. I mean, first, I mean Connish was a little eh, hot goblin just killing his own teammates. That's just what happens in the end. And, oh, speaking of access, access. And, next, number, and right? next episode, you're going to be reading the grand finale. Thank you, God. I'm I mean, glad I decided not to get that. I don't know why you got that, but... Okay. No, I, I just want to end, like, see how this ends. So, it's uh, basically Spider-Man and Carnage going up against uh, Apocalypse and the team right here. And they work together, which I thought was really something else. Then we have Thor who comes in that goes up against Apocalypse and here's some artwork. Which is drawn very nicely, I will say that much. And uh, it's just a whole fight scene where, um, you know, just Thor's really a little bit what's focused on. And uh, Loki actually tries to help him out in the fight. And of course, Loki being mischievous, uses a portal, thinking that Thor will follow him. Uh, Claw is also, I don't even know why still. And um, then there's Wanda who's going up against Magneto and uh, her brother with all that. And um, there's a little bit of a uh, return of a certain character that's going to return in the book. And you'll see who it is in the, uh, <clears throat> in the end. And basically that person in the end would be the original Steve Rogers just saying to them, I'm getting the Red Skull out of here, so stand down, or I can't guarantee your safety. So he's trying to basically help the Red Skull. I wish they would just give Steve Rogers back, you know, somehow. I mean, he still did. looks good. In he the needs to be blue. Captain America again. I mean, this is dumb. First they killed him, then they brought him back a couple mm -hmm. of years later. Now they screwed him up somehow and sucked all the... Uh, First, they took the Super Soldier Serum away from him. Then, yeah, now yeah. they took the Super Soldier Serum away from him, and they aged him. Enough is enough, Marvel. I mean, seriously, you're screwing around with Cap, Thor, and Iron Man. Iron Man's messed up in the head. Thor is not Thor anymore because of something Nick Fury said. And now Steve Rogers, you screwed around with the Super Soldier Serum, and now Falcon is the stand-in instead oh, of Bucky. Oh for real, you guys need to put the original characters back in their slots. If you can't tell a story, if a writer cannot write a story, this is just like the excuse with the whole marriage thing. If you guys cannot tell a story with the original characters, then you then obviously this is not the book for you. That's just my opinion. And if you want to do this as a little thing, you know, some breath of fresh air, that's fine. Just don't do it for too long because it just it's annoying. And I don't even read uh, Cap or Thor. And it's annoying. Tom Taylor's doing an excellent job with Iron Man, though, so I really can't be too upset with Iron Man. But with Captain America and Thor, I mean, for real, we can't have Steve Rogers as Captain America for more than a year or two before you guys either shift him off to being in uh, Steve Rogers' age in the shield or Bucky Cap or now we have Falcon Cap. I mean, seriously, leave Cap alone for, like, at least five, ten years before you shift him off of being Captain America and put him into something else. Going into DC Comics, Digital First is Smallville Continuity Issue Number 1. The Monitors are already attacking Smallville's Earth. And it's up to Clark and Bruce and the rest of the Justice League, which the Justice League is now formed, to make it, for, to make it stand against the Monitors. And basically that's what this entire book is. Basically the preparation and the um, gathering of all the superheroes in the Smallville universe and basically figuring out what to do next. And the ending basically says it all. They're going to war. Each and every one of them. So Clark basically tells everybody, say your goodbyes, and then ladies and gentlemen, it's time to go to war. To be continued. Hmm. This is a digital first book, and I mean, guys, this, you, you guys are further along than I am, especially if you're into the digital first books 
before, you know, digitally, because they're already in book two of continuity. I'm sad to see Smallville leaving. I really am. But hopefully at least it'll go out in a blaze of glory. All right, we have Trinity of Sin, issue number three. And from what I'm hearing, only three more issues until it gets canceled. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the six. Yeah. Smallville, this, the Lantern books, thank you God, except for two. Yeah. So basically, the Fam Stranger, Question, and Pandora are on a uh, different uh, universe, so to speak. And uh, they're trying to figure out, you know, where they are, and uh, they come up against, uh, I believe, Nimra. Yeah, Nimra. And uh, basically, Nimra's just trying to play with everyone's mind. Like, basically, to make them uh, the three slaves, by the way. Here's that. Like, you know, to, to cater to them and everything. And uh, it says so right here, like, um, like their final humiliation to all that. Like, basically, uh, Pandora would be a slave, among other slaves, uh, to work the wheel. Fam Stranger would uh, bait Nimrod until uh, you know he can no more, and the question, well, he would just suffer until he can suffer no more, and he'll come to love it. So they say. So it's kind of a little uh, <laughs> dark, dark there. But then Pandora, she finds a way out, or it was dream, so they say, and there's all these uh, demons that they go up against and. The question I have to say is not a team player because as the issue <clears throat> goes further, we find out um, oh, what, what's that thing called? Like there's this um, this staff that the um, that Nimra used. Um, like like the the they basically betrayed them. How's that? So, I'm telling you, I don't know why they're making Trinity of Sin if the question is not being pl a playable character. So, it's either you can make Fam Stranger and Pandora Story and leave the question out, because he's just not being a team member. So, I don't even know why they had him in it. He's not going to play long nice. Green Lantern New Guardians 37, definitely the lowest of my pile this week. Uh, Kyle is now back. John Stewart, St. Walker. Uh, uh, meet up with Kyle and Carol. You have Metroid uh, who makes a, a small appearance and gives them uh, a mother box. A Metro Metron, I believe, isn't it? Oh, God, why did his name come in that? It came and then it left just as fast. Um, anyway, he gives them a mother box. They use the mother box to teleport to where John and St. Walker are. Basically, um, Kyle figures out that High Father, no matter what, won't let his people kill Kyle for some reason. And they don't know why, so Kyle kind of uses it to his advantage all the way till he gets to High Father. And he, he wants to get his ring back so that he can become a White Lantern again and then fight High Father. However, when Kyle does get his ring back, it turns out that all Father basically has the life equation now, basically having all of the White Lantern's powers, and the White Lantern ring is basically. Nothing. Wow. Again, I'm so glad next week, that's it. Or that's next, the God oh, today, this, the, tomorrow when we get our books, it's going to be the New Guardians uh, annual, and I believe there's one more part in, um, this and that, this and that, I don't know, but I know there's two more parts to Godhead, and then we're done finished and this is that will be where I'm done with all the Green Lantern books I'll continue Sinestro and I'll continue Red Lanterns actually all the way to its end Red Lanterns will be ending in March unfortunately but I will follow through and finish uh, Guy Gardner's run in Red Lanterns but I'm officially done with Green Lanterns I just don't see any saving grace at this point with the Green Lantern books I mean maybe when the books get cut down to literally just one Green Lantern book a month, maybe things will survive. Maybe things will get better. I, I, ju I just don't see it. I mean, and I love Robin Deddy's work on, um, oh God, XO Man of War. I just, oh, yeah. it's not work. It, the stories aren't working for me with the Green Lantern. I'm just not feeling it. 
Okay, we got Batman and Robin issue number 37. This can be summed up easily. Batman goes up against Darkseid and beats the crap out of him. And it, I don't know why, but for me, it seems like Batman kind of took Darkseid out a bit too easily. And he tricks Darkseid into using his Omega Beam so he could charge up the uh, Crystal, the um, Chaos Shard. Batman and the others escape back to Earth. Batman uses the Chaos Shard, basically almost kills himself. And guess what? The thing we all knew was going to happen, happened. Damien's alive again. I called this about a year ago when they killed Damien. I said he'll be back. But now it's all to be concluded in Robin Rises Alpha, which comes out this week also, because now Batman's down for the count, and we don't know what's happening with Bruce. And, yeah, like I said, now Damien's alive again, and now we have to... Now Damien's going to have superpowers starting next month. This is going to be exciting. Oh, boy. <clears throat> now we're shifting gears into the Batman title. Batman 37. Batman's been out for some time, thanks to the Joker. And we find out that there might be something more going on with the Joker. Something that dates back to... Basically before Bruce was even born, and we find out that Alfred and his daughter tried every single uh, toxin for the Joker's new drug that's basically screwing around with all of Gotham, and none of the toxins are working, so basically Bruce is doing what they're doing in Justice League, looking for Patient Zero, uh, and he's going to basically find uh, the cure through Patient Zero, because obviously Patient Zero has a bit of a... Um, antibody towards it so you find patient zero you find the cure basically and he sees everything that's going on in the city and I love the internal dialogue here because Scott Snyder is basically having Batman say you're Batman you'll figure this out and I think Batman's starting to doubt himself a bit and you could see it and Jim Gordon's kind of locked himself away waiting for Batman and Batman comes back and he's like well what's going on where's the toxin I'm sitting there waiting and Batman's like I have no clue but don't worry I'll get it Joker attacks uh, Jim Gordon. We find out Patient Zero is Joe Chill, which is another shock, another twist. I love this story. This t story takes so many twists and turns. And then you have Jim Gordon shooting the Joker, and he comes back. So apparently there's some type of a supernatural connection, I believe, with the Joker. I didn't waste my time with the second story. At this point, I just, I'm just not interested enough to read the second story. I'm just letting it go. But apparently it explains the connection between Joker and how he's been around for so many years and Jim Gordon does some research on this hospital and that's where he sees like a billion pictures of the of the Joker and he thinks the Joker doctored them but it turns out that the Joker might actually have a very deep tie to the past of Gotham and as much as I like the whole okay the Joker's kind of mystical okay well we're running we ran out of time but I like the whole supernatural connection with the Joker where kind of can, Batman can't kill the Joker because he's this kind of, he's something else. He's not human, like Batman's not yeah. human. But at the same time, it, this needs to be written right now. Honestly, I wouldn't trust it with anybody. I would trust this only with a few writers, but I think Scott Snyder can definitely pull this off also. So looking forward to the next issue and seeing where this whole Joker story is going. This is really good. I would definitely recommend uh, Batman 37. So guys... Give us two seconds. We're going to uh, really quickly um, switch up the part. The we're gonna push the button, and then we'll be back with the rest of DC Comics. All right, we're back, and we're continuing along, continuing with Batman for two more issues because Batman's connected with that one. We got Batman Superman issue number seventeen. This continues to be really good. So. Batman and Superman can't figure out who this person is that's targeted Superman and all the people he's cared about. Uh, Superman ends up saving Lex Luthor, Ray, but at the cost of, um, oh, what's his name, uh, who died, the, oh, who died, I can't remember, General Ahmad, um, Something. Uh, General Ahmad, who basically Superman saved years ago from uh, two bombings and an air assault. So he basically saved him three times in a row just to have him killed by this unknown person. And I love the dialogue between Lex and Superman at the beginning where Lex loves how Superman's accusing him right away. And he kind of helps solve things, so to speak, or explain how he can't be involved. 
and how the, the death of the general basically means at least 12 more years of war in Kondak. And you see Superman kind of mourning the death of the general. And then going right back to Batman and still trying to figure out who this person is. They go to even Hector Hammond for help. And he really can't help. But there is one person on the planet that almost fits the description. And gee, look, it's Lobo. So Lobo we get the first ever fight between Lobo and Superman in the new 52. And Superman basically beats the shit out of Lobo. And finds out it isn't Lobo that's the person but basically tells Lobo to get the hell off the planet and never come back, and he's like, make me. And I love how Superman basically just throws him off the earth, throws him out of the earth, so to speak, and bye-bye Lobo, but it's not Lobo, and somebody else is reaching out, and the person who's focusing on Superman says, you know, you think you're getting closer, but you're not. You're not even a little bit close. And Batman basically has everybody who's close to Superman, who's related to Superman, who's friends with Superman, who Superman is associated with under protection except one person, his bait, Lois Lane. Definitely looking forward to the next issue. I like how in this issue really Superman tries his hardest to figure out who it is, but even Batman sees, you know, it's not going to happen real quick. And every time Superman's like, uh, I don't want to be like you, Batman's like, I don't want to be like me. Or Superman's like, uh, Batman tells Superman you can't obsess over it, and he's like, how do you deal with it? And he's like, I don't even like it, or something like that. Where was it? It was a scene right at the very beginning where he bumps into Batman. Oh, don't let uh, this person get under your skin. He's like, says the guy in a bat suit, and he's like, yeah, one of us is enough. I love that dialogue. It's like Batman's trying to tell Superman, listen, I'm Batman, period. Nobody else should be me. I don't even like being me. I like that. Well, in Justice League issue number 37, Superman and Batman have found Patient Zero, and the villain from the beginning of the story arc, Bullet, uh, sets his sights on Lex Luthor. Uh, Superman and Batman are fighting Patient Zero, who basically is like a mazo. He can adapt and uh, copy any power he witnesses, so flight, heat vision, the artwork in all these books are amazing, by the way. Uh, you got Lex's sister who's trying to confront him about why he even had the Amazo virus, what the purpose of it was, and Lex doesn't want to answer. You have Wonder Woman who comes in to try to catch Patient Zero. That doesn't work, and then long story short, after this entire fight, turns out, in the end, we have Bullet, who basically has Lex Luthor laying there unconscious. There was an explosion uh, caused by um, Bullet. And um, basically, he's about to kill Lex, and we find out, spoiler alert here, Batman has been exposed thanks to Patient Zero. And they still don't have the blood sample they need, so they need to retake the blood sample from Patient Zero. Well, that's going to be tough. This is a really good story arc. I'm enjoying it. I really can't wait for the summer Justice League story arc, though, with the whole... Dark side and um, the monitor, which kind of makes me wonder. Obviously, convergence isn't going to be as much of a crisis as I think everybody's going to be setting it up to be, because if the dark side is going to be fighting the monitor, that very well could be the the whole crisis event, which will lead into the September 52 issues, 3D covers again. Maybe I don't know, but. I, I feel like at this point with DC Comics, we're all thinking too hard on it, and we should just take DC Comics month by month. That's what I've decided to do in the coming year. That's my New Year's resolution when it comes to DC Comics, just to take each month, month by month, not hope for anything, not really look forward, not hope that one thing leads into another, not overthink anything, just enjoy the books for what they're worth each and every month. And whatever happens, happens. If it's something I just really can't deal with, goodbye. Wonder Woman 37, we've all been asking, where is Donna Troy? You know, ever since the new 52, we've not gotten Donna Troy. And it's like, where's Wonder Girl? This is the Wonder Girl, the first Wonder Girl. In this issue, Wonder Woman is being questioned by the Amazons because either she's busy dealing with stuff on in the world of man, so to speak, or she's too focused on bringing change to the island and we get a little bit of a prologue where this baby's being sacrificed because they see something's gonna happen at some point in the future 
You have Wonder Woman who found out her mother was destroyed. Her statue, her mother's statue was clay. destroyed. And uh, basically the Amazons are telling Wonder Woman, you have to make a choice to stay here or, you know, be part of the world of men. You can't have both. And she's like, no. And then they go under attack. And I love David Finch's artwork. And Meredith Finch couldn't write this any better. And you know what? The whole bringing in of Donna Troy at the very end... Basically, Donna Troy is the answer against Wonder Woman. Since Wonder Woman's obviously chosen the world of man, they're bringing Donna Troy in to take her rightful place among the Amazons. I don't know if they mean as queen or as an Amazon, period, to be Wonder Woman's equal or possibly better. But one thing I like is I know that I have faith in Meredith Finch's writing. I love Meredith Finch's writing from what I've read in Xenoscope and what I've been reading in the two issues I've read of Wonder Woman. And if anybody could bring, bring Donna Troy back into the DC Universe, Meredith Finch definitely can do it. And with her husband, David Finch's artwork, this book is going to skyrocket into my top five books from DC Comics next year. If they stay out. Listen, if you could keep... Azzarello on this book for 35 issues, you damn well better keep David and Meredith Finch on this book for another 35 issues. Or at least until you reboot your universe in a year or two. Or somehow soft <coughs> reboot it. We're in the weeklies now, and Batman Eternal 37 focuses on Catwoman doing her dirty, sneaky thing. You know, she's part of the... Uh, she wants to become the kingpin of the underworld now, and she basically does. You have Batman dealing with what Jason Barr did. Jason Barr trying to reach out to the police to try to get you know them back on his side, and that's not working. You have all the Arkhamites basically making a plan against Batman and, and uh, Gotham. And then basically at the end of the book, you have Catwoman saying, I'm going to hand you uh, all of the... Um, the worst of Arkham wrapped in one tiny bow just for you, Batman. And then you have, uh, oh God, Luke Fox dealing with some ghosts. And this could be connected to the whole thing that went on with Arkham Asylum. That's the long and short of this book. I don't know. I didn't enjoy this book this week too much. There was a little progression, but again, I'm not really interested in Catwoman's rise to becoming the kingpin of Gotham. Future's End 33, you have Cole, um, 50 Sue reaching out trying to find Cole. And actually, ironically, she somehow finds him because his friend is uh, walking in plain, uh, you know, pu in the public. And uh, she happens to hear him and beats him up and takes his phone. I love the beginning where you have Frankenstein and everybody who um, was, I want to say the Ages of Shade, but they're not anymore. It's Frankenstein, Adam, Black Adam, uh, Amethyst, uh, I forgot her name, the Controller and Hawkman versus Shade. And it's a really high impact fighting and you get to see um, the hive mind finally. And uh, Oh, Father Time, I'm sorry, Father Time, not hive mind, Father Time. And uh, it looks like Adam's going to be going up against him. Then you get a little bit of Terry and Plastique. And you find out that uh, Brother Eyes can reconnecting with Plastique's future self, so to speak. And then you get some Firestorm. I like the artwork with Firestorm, I will say that. Again, these are the last books I read, guys, and I really sped read through them because I really wanted to get through this. But we do get the beginning of Dr. Polaris. Those of you who remember Dr. Polaris in pre-New 52, this is his New 52 debut. And then we're going to get Convergence, and it's going to change everything all over again, probably. From the coming attractions, it looks like we're going to be focusing a lot more on future Ty soon, and Adam is going to be fighting for all the time. Definitely looks interesting. I'll see where the next issue goes. But I definitely have to hand it to World's End Issue 11. Just when you think things can't get any worse for Earth 2, they do. Dark Side in Prisons, Mr. Miracle... And Fury, it looks like Fury actually joins back up with Darkseid, but it's all a ploy uh, in order to save Mr. Miracle. Uh, she actually saves Mr. Miracle, and Sloane, or as he likes to call himself, the Traveler, um, who's not from Earth 2, he's not from um, the New 52 Earth, he's from some Earth that's being apparently 
hidden away somewhere. But he tells Fury to take Mr. Miracle and listen into the conversation between him and Darkseid. And it turns out that High Father made a deal with Darkseid. Uh, the trading of the sons, Orion and um, oh God, Calabac, were traded. And also the promise that Darkseid could have basically Earth 2 in order to keep peace between New Genesis and Apocalypse. So basically, uh, All Father isn't coming to the rescue for Earth 2. Earth 2 is basically on its own. The new gods will not be there to help. So basically, Mr. Miracle said, Our, bro our, bro our, death. our fathers have left us... Um, our fates lie on. Uh, our fates are on our own. There's no nobody's coming. There's no cavalry. All our fathers come. What may uh, what is the um, basically they have to be the gods for their um, their own earth basically because there's no gods coming to protect Earth two from dark side and basically it's up to Mister Miracle and the heroes on Earth two to stop Darkseid. There's no cavalry, there's no Mr. Miracle reaching out to Allfather for help because basically Allfather basically signed off on Earth 2 so Darkseid would keep peace between New Genesis and Apocalypse. This is dark, but this was good because now Mr. Miracle realizes he's alone. It's him, Fury, and whoever's on Earth 2 and that's it. There's no one else coming. They're all alone and we all know what's going to happen in the end. Earth 2 is going to be destroyed and they're all going to come to uh, the New 52 world, but Convergence is going to happen, and that might change everything. But I believe Earth 2 is ending anyway, so come what may, Earth 2 is definitely going to be gone from the 52 titles that DC is releasing. And that's it for this week, guys. I'm really sorry for the briefies, for the, you know, leaving out of probably very important details of certain books, but everything's late. The good news is that in two weeks, the Big 2 review is going to be super short. So there is no way uh, we won't be able to catch up in about a week or two. Right. So Anyway, thank you guys so much for sticking with us. Feel free to leave any comments below, likes, dislikes, whether you agree or disagree with anything we have to say. Recommendations are always welcome. As always, don't forget to check out Comic Related, Comic Frontline, Zone 4 Podcast, Frontline Gaming Zone. Together we are your number one source for Comic Related news, reviews, and a whole bunch more. We'll see you guys really soon, probably tomorrow with the Comic Book Call. And as always, take care, keep reading, keep collecting. We'll see you guys in the next review. Bye, everybody.